Happy Thanksgiving this week to everybody. Hope you have a good holiday season with uh, family or friends or however you're going to spend Thanksgiving. You know, it's funny. We have uh, one day out of the year that we give thanks, but the Lord wants us to give thanks every day. Amen. Every day. There's always something to be thankful for. Even though there's, there are times of hardship in your life, we all experience hardship. We all experience times of suffering, um, just at various stages in our life. But there's always something to be thankful for. Oh, Someone dropped a key, Willie. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> well, there's always something to be thankful for. I love the story in the Bible where there was the, the ten lepers that Jesus healed. You know, Jesus reached out and touched their lives. I mean, think about how that would have been for a guy that had leprosy and had to really be separated from everybody. He had to call out unclean, unclean, and they were like a, an outcast of society. And leprosy is a terrible, terrible disease where it you know, begins to take off your extremity. I mean, people's noses fall off, their ears, their fingers. It's just a terrible, terrible disease. But Jesus healed these 10 men. And the Bible says only one came back to say thank you. And uh, Jesus said, weren't there ten? Where's the other nine? And I wonder if that ever happens in our life where the Lord does something. Maybe we take it for granted. Maybe we, we forget. Who knows the reason why? But I think the Lord is blessed when we, when we thank him. Right. It's not that he's on any kind of a pride trip. It's just it acknowledges that God is at work in our life. It's probably better for us than for him that we are thankful because it constantly reminds us of who is our provider, who is our protector, who is the strong one, who is the one who loves us. And to be a thankful person is constantly acknowledging God's work in our lives. So maybe today, before Thanksgiving comes, you might sit down and think, Lord, I wonder what are the things I have to be thankful for? Maybe make a list of them. And stick them up somewhere so the next time you feel discouraged because of some event or happening in your life, you can pull off that piece of paper and say, Lord, you know what? I, I want to remind myself I have so much to be thankful for. Amen. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for loving us that you would send your son. Today we're going to look at some of these chapters in the book of John about the, the arrest and execution of Jesus. But all this was done for us. I pray that we would always be grateful, Lord, thankful for the cross, thankful for you being willing to come and die, thankful that you loved us enough, that you wanted a relationship with us enough to pay such a price. Open our hearts now to your word, we ask, and teach us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin, uh, we're going to look today at John chapter 18 and 19. We're going to go through two chapters this morning. But I want to first begin in Psalm 62. And I'm going to read this out of the NLRV. I'm not even sure what that is. Psalm 62, 11. God, I have heard you say two things. One is that you, God, are strong. See, God said that. God, I have heard you say two things. One is that you, God, are strong. And the other is that you, Lord, are loving. I mean, if God wanted to say something to you, maybe those are the two things he would want to say. Kirk, I'm strong and I'm loving. 
it's good to know that our God is both strong and loving. Sometimes we think those are like mutually exclusive traits in a person's life. They're either a strong person or they're a loving person. And how can a loving person be strong and how can a strong person be loving? But our Lord is perfectly both of those. And he tries to communicate. He says, I, I have heard you say two things, God. One is that, and this is how the Lord would say it, I am strong and I'm loving. How strong is he? How strong is God? I mean, there's nothing impossible for him, is there? There's nothing he can't do. And we see story after story after story of this throughout the Bible where God shows and displays his strength. There's no one more strong than the Lord. And how loving is he? But we heard some testimonies today, some exhortations, some songs we sang. How loving is God? Perfectly. No one can love more perfectly than him. And the reason I wanted to start with this scripture, because it's probably, I mean, I don't know, I'm just guessing, that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the execution of Christ, probably displays both of those characteristics more than any event in the Bible, that he is strong and he is loving. And I want to today just identify from these couple chapters things that kind of show how strong the Lord is and also how loving he is. So let's start off in John 18, verse 3. God, you are strong. I'm in 18, verse 3. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus had just finished the Last Supper. He was going out with his disciples, and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible says that Judas had left the Last Supper. He went out, and he basically betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And he got a band of soldiers. And I looked this up. It's on the Internet, so you know it's true. A band of soldiers is anywhere between 300 and 600 soldiers. Why would you need so many to arrest Jesus? Because he's strong. I'm sure these guys were afraid of what he could do. They brought a band of soldiers. They brought lanterns, torches, and weapons to get this, this man who never did anything but acts of kindness. And it says in verse 4, Jesus knowing all that would happen to him. Now, if you remember earlier, it's not in this particular chapter, but earlier that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So what was coming was a, a terrible situation, not just in the physical. I mean, the fact that he was going to be crucified and beaten and whipped and all those things, but the fact that he was taking upon himself the sin of the world and would be separated from his heavenly father. And it says here, Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, chickened out. Does your Bible say that? No, he came forward. Three to 600 men were there with torches, weapons. He knew what was going to happen. But he came forward because he wasn't afraid. He was strong. I mean, even as a man, he was strong. And he said to them, whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. 
They drew back and fell to the ground, three to six hundred soldiers with weapons. What is it that made him fall? I mean, there is the idea, when he says, I am he, the actual, the word he is not really there in the, in the um, original writings. It's just he says, I am. And I don't know if you remember, but there were a couple times that Jesus spoke about being I am, and it literally is saying, I am God. And I don't know if the Lord in that moment just kind of pulled back the cover of his divinity and it blew them over, or if just the, just the power of who he was stood there and said, I am he, and they just kind of cowered back. Whatever the reason, Jesus is strong. And I have some scriptures here. In, uh, I want to read John 8, verse 58. There were a couple other places where Jesus said, I am. In John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What is he saying here? Abraham lived thousands of years before this. And Jesus is telling these people, I want you to know, truly, truly, verily, verily, before Abraham was, I am. And if you remember when Moses came to the burning bush and he was asking the Lord, what is your name? The Lord's name was, he said, I am. Tell them I am has sent you. So when Jesus stood up and said to these people, I am, he was saying, I'm God. As a matter of fact, another scripture in John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, I told you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that Jesus is God, you will die in your sins. Some people want to believe that Jesus was a great teacher or he was a great philosopher or a great prophet. But they don't want to go as far to say he was God in the flesh. And Jesus is saying in these verses in John 8, I am. The very one who spoke to Moses, I am. And when he stood there in the garden of Gethsemane, and he said, who are you coming after? And they said, Jesus. He said, I am. And it says they all drew back and fell to the ground. So Jesus is strong because... Number one, he's God. Another reason why he's strong is because he was submitted to the will of the Father. When Jesus came to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. You know, it's, it's kind of like in his flesh. If there was a different way, he maybe would have taken that path, but there was no other way. But he yielded to the will of the Father. Three times he prayed that. If there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's the way we can also show our strength in the Lord is by surrender. We talked today about being surrendered to the Lord. To be surrendered to the Lord is not, a, is not an act of weakness. It is actually an act of strength. To be willing to say, I'm going to lay aside my will and the thing that I want for my life and surrender to yours. That takes strength. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. In verse 10, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. I love this guy. One against 300. But he had this heart, and he pulls his sword out. He struck the high priest's servant, and it says it cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. So I put down here, Jesus did not defend himself. He came out, said, I'm he. Peter tries to start a revolt. What were you going to do with, you know, 11 guys and Jesus? Maybe you had one or two swords, who knows? 
How are you going to fight against these people? But Jesus didn't raise a revolt. He didn't encourage Peter. He said, put your sword away, Peter. So he didn't defend himself. He didn't look for a way out. He came forward. He was strong. And I think his love was seen in the fact that he put the man's ear back on. What if you were that guy? Aren't you glad that Jesus is loving? That your ear's laying there on the ground and you, you know, Jesus walks over and instead of saying, hey, you are coming out to take me to execute me, you deserve to have your ear cut off. But Jesus reaches down and puts his ear back on. And it, it's healed. I mean, I mean, I can't believe that the guys that were there who saw that didn't say, hey, guys, you know, we're, we're doing the wrong thing here. <laughs> Let's just go home. But they, they were just so caught up in the, the event, the, just the, the wickedness of it, driven by the enemy, for sure. Jesus did not defend himself. He said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. Strength. And he says in verse 11, the next part, he says, uh, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? That's what he told Peter. You know, he had prayed always earlier three times, take this cup, take this cup, take this cup. And now he's saying, Peter, I'm going to drink the cup the Father's given me. There's no fighting here. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and they bound him. The next thing I want to say to you is, is found in Matthew 26. So I have the scripture up here, I think. He showed restraint. In the story in Matthew, he adds a, another element here. It says, Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Remember the story of uh, Elisha that had the servant that was in the tent and they came out and they saw the enemy surrounding them and the servant was afraid because they were surrounded and the, and the, the, the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes to see. And all around them, there were angels, more powerful and more mighty. We don't really see some, we don't really see ever, really, unless the Lord opens your eyes, what's happening in the spiritual realm. And Jesus is telling these guys here, don't you realize that in a moment's time, I can just ask the Father for 12,000 angels. Now, how many of you know that it only would take one angel to deal with this band of soldiers? with his hand tied behind his back and one finger. But Jesus said, I could call 12 legions. What would you have done? Father, please send the 12 legions. Man, this is really, really getting bad here. But Jesus was strong. He came for a purpose. He came to do the will of the Father. He knew what it was. He knew what it was. He knew what would happen. And he came forward. He drank the cup. He did not defend himself. And he showed restraint. And then he says in Matthew 26, 54, how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? You see, another thing that Jesus had in his heart was to fulfill the word of God. I want to share with you some scriptures from these chapters, chapter 19, beginning over there, some scriptures that show uh, a fulfillment of prophecy through what happened at the crucifixion. And I believe the word of God is another thing that shows the strength of the Lord. Sometimes we think of the Bible as just a book, but it is the power of God, his word. It's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Now in John 19, 23... If you want to turn over there, John 19, 23. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that Jesus sat there, you know, on the cross, he pulled out a notebook and he's starting to put a check mark like, okay, that prophecy is fulfilled, that prophecy. But he knew this was prophesied. He knew that he was in the destiny of his calling, his purpose 
why he came to the earth. For this purpose I came, Father. And so now he's, we're going to see through these scriptures fulfillment of prophecies that were written hundreds of years earlier. It says there in verse 23, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but let's cast lots to see whose it shall be. And look what it says. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says... They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. And so the soldiers did these things. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. He was hanging on the cross. It was a, maybe a hot day, but he was thirsty. He'd been suffering all night. And he called out, I thirst. And that was a fulfillment of a prophecy written hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. There was a jar full of sour wine which stood there. And so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Verse 31. Since it was the day of the preparation, and so that, no, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. So here, understand that in a, in a crucifixion, what happens is the person is hanging and they hang by the nails. But when they do, they, they, they kind of hang by their wrist to let the pressure off the pain that's in their feet from that nail. But when they hang down, their lungs, it's like they, they can breathe out, but they can't suck air in. And so they begin to suffocate. And so they pick themselves up to try to get air. But there's the way that nail is in the foot, it causes like this shooting pain all through the body on a certain nerve. So you can only take it for so long and you come down again. And it's this constant up and down, trying to get air, pain, trying to get air. And you do that until eventually you die. Well, at this point, they wanted to wrap things up because the Sabbath was coming. And uh, the soldiers decided to break the legs of the men that were on the cross so that they couldn't pick themselves up anymore. And this way they would suffocate more quickly. So it says the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and of the other. Remember, there were two who were crucified with Jesus, one on the right, one on the left. So they broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it bore witness. And this is John. He was there. He was standing there and saw this. He who saw it bore witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. Look at verse 36. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. That was written over 500 years before the cross by King David in one of the Psalms. It was a prophecy speaking about the day that the Christ would die. And he said, not one of his bones would be broken. Who, who would ever imagine that something that David could see or prophesy about 500 years ago would actually take place? And it's amazing how it did because there was the intention of going and breaking all the legs. It would have just been just as easy to break all the legs and be done with it. But they came to Jesus and they noticed he was already dead. So they chose 
not to break the legs, not even recognizing they were fulfilling prophecy. It's the power of God's word. He watches over his word to perform it, the scripture says. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. That's from the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. They will look on him whom they have pierced. It's speaking about their Messiah. They pierced him. And in Psalm 34, verse 20, it says, He keeps all his bones. Not one of them was broken. It's sort of reminiscent of the Passover lamb that didn't have any broken bones. I want to take just a minute and look through Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is a prophecy or a psalm written by David. It is prophetic. And many of the things that are written there relate to the execution of Jesus Christ. And this psalm was written in 587 B.C. So almost 600 years before Jesus actually died on the cross... David, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, proclaimed these things that we'll read here. Uh, First is Psalm 22, verse 1. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, those are the exact words of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Mark 15, verse 34. As Jesus hung on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's quoted right out of Psalm 22, verse 1. In verse 7, Psalm 22, verse 7, he says, All who see me mock me. I mean, imagine the people standing there at the foot of the cross. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let, Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. You know, those words were spoken by the priest who were standing down there at the cross. You trusted in the Lord, let him deliver you. Let him take you from the cross. And they wagged their heads and they mocked him. Matthew 27, verse 39 through 44. It says they mocked him and they spoke these words. He trusted in the Lord, let him Deliver him. These are the very words prophesied by David 600 years earlier. So it wasn't just Jesus pulling off a check mark. This was, this was the priest, the scribes who were down there fulfilling the prophecy, saying these exact words. That's the power of God's word. Verse 14 it says, I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint, my heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. Well, you know, when they crucify a person, oftentimes from this hanging, they say the shoulder joints come out. So It says my joints, my bones are all out of joint. He spoke that. He talked about being poured out like water, his heart like wax. When they stuck the spear up through Jesus' side, it came and, and pierced his heart. And it says blood and water flowed out. It seems like this a description of what happened here in Psalm 22, verse 14. Isn't that amazing? Verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Sounds like thirst to me. My tongue sticks to my jaws. Jesus cried out for for water or something, I thirst, he said in John 19, verse 28 through 30. Verse 16, Psalm 22, 16, dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. In Mark 15, it says that they pierced his hands and feet with the nails. And again, this was written... 600 years before the event. It is God speaking into the future. Here is what's going to happen to my Messiah, the one I'm sending. Isn't it amazing how almost like word for word this thing is coming to pass 
in just a few hours' time on the cross of, of the execution of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, it says, I can count all my bones. You know, when they would whip a person, they had these pieces of bone and fragments. It would r literally rip your skin off. I mean, it, it wasn't like just getting a welt. They would, they would hit you with this thing and then rip and pull like flesh would come. And he says, maybe, maybe, there was ex maybe things were exposed, you know, his bones. He could, I could see all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. Jesus hung on the cross naked, which would have been, I mean, that's shameful for anybody, but for him and for a Jewish man, it would have been terrible to be there in front of the Gentile. But that's where it was. They stare and they gloat over me. Verse 18, it says, They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. And we just read about that in, in the story in John. That they, they, they tore the one apart into four pieces and gave it to everybody. But there was one that was woven of one piece. It was just one good cloth. They decided instead of tearing it, let's cast lots for it. How did they know that was in a prophecy? How did they know they were fulfilling the word of God by saying, hey, let's, let's uh, throw dice for this one. But yet it was the power of God's word. And I love verse 27 and 28. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. That's why the evangelism of the world is so much a part of the plan of God. All the ends of the earth, every nation. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he said, now take this gospel, this message and make disciples of, na of all nations. And now we are really spreading throughout the world. There are still some places that haven't heard, but I mean, there's millions and millions and millions and millions of people all around the world who are remembering and turning to the Lord. This is why he did it. He died on the cross so that men could turn to him. And so we see a fulfillment of that even today. It happened in your life when you came to Jesus. You know, you're far removed from Jerusalem when you live here in Alliance, Ohio. But that message has gone throughout the world. It ended up here one day. And one day somebody came and told you about the good news of Jesus. And you said, yes, I remember. And I turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. We sang that song earlier and we read in, in Revelation chapter 5 that there would be people there from every nation, every tongue, every tribe, standing before the throne. That's why Jesus died. It, it, it pleased the Father to bruise him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He looked forward to the day that what he did there accomplished the salvation of people. It's all about you. And so you see his power, but you see his love. How, how can you separate those two? at the cross. All the suffering, all the pain, all the hardships that he endured was because of his great love for us. Verse 28, for kingship belongs to the Lord. Amen. There's no other king but Jesus. Kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. In verse 31, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Amen. That's you and me. And maybe there's still some yet, still unborn. You're going to have a baby soon, right? Anybody else having a baby soon? It's still unborn, but you know that baby's going to hear, yeah, the baby is going to hear about the Lord, right? Amen. <laughs> they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. He has done it. And that really, if you look at the Hebrew words there, it sounds a lot like it is finished. When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Well, I'm going to close by just sharing a few ways that Jesus showed his love at the, cruci at the crucifixion. One is in verse 7 of, eight, of chapter 18, 
when they came to get him with a band of soldiers, and he asked them, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I told you that I am he. And then what did he say next? If you seek me, let these men go. You know how it is when you're suffering, you want someone to suffer with you. Isn't that how we are? Come and suffer with me. Come on. I'm really going through a hard time. Come over here and be miserable with me, please. <laughs> Jesus says, let these, let these men go. It was a one-man deal. One man would die for the nation. Let these men go. What were they going to do? He just, he just basically bowled them all over. He put a guy's ear back on. Let these men go. They were his brothers. And it says in verse 9, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those you gave me, I have lost not one. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That there, and probably the most, the moment of the greatest duress in his life, he's caring about the ones he loves. Let him go. Because I said, I've not lost any of them, except Judas. I love that about Jesus. He's not so self-absorbed that he doesn't care about us, every one of us. And you see that just come out in such, such a definite way in these moments before the crucifixion. It's not in this chapter, but another place, Jesus is hanging on the cross and he tells one of the thieves, today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that amazing? Again, you're there suffering. You got your own agony. And you hear these guys kind of arguing a little bit on the side, him over here, him over there. And the one guy says, hey, we deserve to be here, but this man did nothing. And he, he turns and he says, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. If you were that thief, wouldn't that have been the greatest message you could have heard? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus was able to love and to save as he's dying on a cross. Verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son, and then to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. I think that's so awesome that Jesus wanted to make sure his mom was taken care of. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us when Joseph died, but it seems like he really wasn't around at this time. And Jesus, being the older brother, would have felt a certain responsibility toward his mother. But again, as he's there in his greatest moment of agony and suffering and, you know, being separated from his father, all these things taking place, there was this love that was there. And he looks down and he says, Hey, John, take care of my mom. You know, I just want, I want to make sure that she's getting her grass cut and whatever she needs. And John says, I got this, Jesus. But that's the love of, that's the love of Christ that's there. He wasn't absorbed with his own suffering. And then... The last one is I'm wondering if the men who actually executed Jesus were saved. It says in Matthew 27, verse 54, when the centurion and those who were with him, so more than one, you see sometimes in the movie one centurion, but there was those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus they saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. I mean, wouldn't that be 
the most awesome thing in the world that you go and see Jesus in heaven and standing there are the guys that executed him. Now, it doesn't say they got saved, but they acknowledged him as the Son of God. Does it take more than that? So, I think that would be awesome. You know, I, I thought when I die, I want to go see King David, but I want to go and ask Jesus, first of all, are these guys here? Because to me, it would be a picture of the greatest victory in the face of Satan. The very ones who came to destroy him were saved because of his love. I don't know. I mean, I'm just speculating here. But it's certainly something to think about. I think I see within this execution of Jesus Christ the the great power of God and the great love of God. You really can't separate them. They're found perfectly joined together in the person of Jesus Christ. And so as we stand, if you would stand with me, I'd like you to think about are you facing something in your life? Maybe you need the power of God. Nothing that's impossible for him. Or maybe you need the love of God. For whatever reason, to sense the love of God in your life. I'm going to pray that God would just open our hearts, all of us, to recognize these two characteristics of Jesus. I mean, they're, they're throughout the scripture, but I said earlier that it seems like within this, this story of the execution that it just stands out in great relief. So, Father, I pray you help us to know that you are strong, that you are loving. There's nothing too great for you that you cannot overcome. There's nothing that overwhelms us that's more powerful than you. And really, who can separate us from the love of God? Tribulation, peril, sword, famine, none of these things. We stand here, Lord, thankful as we're about to enter into this Thanksgiving season, thankful for what you've done. Thankful that you recorded in the word of God these stories so it would help us to understand your heart more and more. I pray that our eyes be opened up to the, the wonderful majesty that is Jesus Christ. I pray that we would take this message also throughout the world. Beginning here in our Jerusalem, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our classmates, our fellow workers. Let us give the message of Jesus so that the reason you died may have fruitfulness even now. Even those yet unborn would hear of this glorious message of Jesus Christ. I pray that you bless each person here now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, if you have a need for prayer, I encourage you to please come up. We'd be glad to pray with you about any, anything you have. Otherwise, take some time to share your love. Meet somebody that you don't know today and tell them hello. And we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>